Howdy once again, this is Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. And I know I've been overdoing the videos with vices, but bear with me as I present yet another one. But you saw in a recent video where I bought this Charlie Parker vice, 4 inch, and I've already owned the large orange one for many, many years, but it was always on the corner of the bench here, and it's a little bit overpowering as a six inch. That is, it lacks the delicate touch. So what I'm gonna do here is refurbish, just clean up and paint the smaller one here, which is in good condition, and I'll videotape that, and then get it mounted on the bench for my everyday user. Recently, I came across this Craftsman 5-inch bench vise, and I mounted it on the corner of my bench simply because the orange one is so heavy it makes the entire bench want to uh, fall over. I talked about that in another video. So I mounted this on the table here, the bench, and I really like the size of it. So that's why I decided to put the Charlie Parker on there and then put this one in storage for now. It is not for sale. Most of you know that I have a love affair with Charles Parker Vices, and Colombian is also one of my favorites. And uh, did you know that this Charles Parker was the same company that produced the fine firearms? I don't know if they still do, but they made some of the most expensive and high quality sporting arms uh, known to mankind. Let me show you a little bit of historical information. This is an advertisement for Parker Vices from a 1931 magazine extolling its virtues. Pause your video to read that if you're so inclined. Let me scan down through the Colombian ad in the 1931 magazine, but it just shocks me that it says at the top that the Colombian Vices are sledge Testa, that is, their bubba proof will not chip, crack, or break, and it does say they are made of malleable iron in the text. Many of you watched a recent video where I purchased this at an auction. It was either $25 or $30. I'm kind of surprised. And it is in quite good shape. It's a 4-inch. And what I do not like is that someone painted the slide here, the ram. So I'm going to remove that paint. This weighs 48 pounds, about half the weight of the big orange one. And there's really nothing that I'm going to do to it other than to clean it up real well and then paint it the usual navy gray. But let me show you something unusual on this that was pointed out to me recently by someone in a comment in a video. And the comment that someone made is that they love their Charlie Parker vise because you could set the handle in the middle position here and it would stay and you could very rapidly move it like this, almost with a flywheel effect without the handle falling down on you like that one. Well, how is that achieved? Five years ago you heard me complain about this vice because I thought the handle was bent. It, it's just most stiff and I cleaned it up, made no difference, but in fact what we have here is a set screw and See, now it slides freely. The set screw is pushing against a rather strong spring because there's only about three quarters of an inch there. I thought maybe there would be a ball in there. But that can be adjusted to however you want it. And I thought, well, that's a real neat feature. And I did get this screw out with some difficulty. And it is a set screw with a point on it. I could not get the spring out because the spring is kind of wound up into the thread. But let's take a look at the smaller one and see what the deal is on that. And so looking at the other vise, I examined the end of the screw and it was so full of grease and crud and dirt that I thought maybe the screw was hidden. But in fact, after cleaning out, found out there was no screw. But in my collection, I found uh, 
a very short slotted one. And I wanted a slotted one to remain authentic, not a hex head. And here's a real stiff little spring that I found in my collection. So between the two of them, I have uh, achieved perfection also in the sliding action. And there it is. And you can adjust the amount of friction. Again, there is no room for a ball in there. I thought perhaps there would be a ball, but as you can see from this view here, there isn't a whole lot of, of space right here for a screw, a spring, and a ball. So the spring itself rides against the handle. There isn't a whole lot of wear or slop here in the movable jaw. You always expect some of that, but perhaps an, another washer in here would take up some of that, but I'm not sure it's necessary. Let's take it apart. The large vise says Parker with two screws holding the retaining device in place. The smaller vise has room for only one screw. A bit of a yoke, if you will. And that's no yoke, as my dad would say. Now is that a 39 or a 29. Someone told me that someplace on the vices there was a date and could that be 1939? Is that what that uh, means or is that a batch number or a pattern number or a casting number? I do not know for sure. Let me know in the comments if you do. I should wear gloves. Have you ever noticed that I very seldom wear gloves? I think they impede my workmanship. Let me measure this and see what the pitch is as well. The pitch is three threads per inch and the diameter is seven eighths. And let's see if the sliding jaw comes right out. That is, will the paint impede that or is someone pounded back here? And it comes right out. Wow, what on earth is this sway back right here? Look at that when I lay a straight edge over that. What on earth happened or what is the purpose or the modification of that or did somebody just have work that is dropping down in there over a period of years. I don't see grinding marks. I don't know what the heck that is. And, and I don't know what that little wrinkling is right here. Well, I will never know and I do not like it, but uh, and there's nothing I can do about it, but I will just go ahead undaunted and live with it. One thing I do not like about the Parker vices, and it kind of shocks me considering what a precision company I considered them to be, they did not machine the bottom. And someone told me a horror story where they have seen these broken, pulled down with two bolts onto a bench, and one of the ears broken off because of that, because they don't really set totally flat on a wooden bench that doesn't make a whole lot of difference but you can see where that could conceivably break off if you over tighten them. I want to get the jaw out and of course it's retained by a pin so looking at it from the bottom we'll see if I can drive the pin out. In, in fact that is the direction that it should move. This is a tapered punch which is probably going to not work. Now let me put the proper punch in there, or a pin punch, 5 sixteenths it looks like it is. Out it comes, albeit bent. And then of course the nut. Well, it should come out.
Note the dovetail. Cleaning the screw with thinner. My daughter gave this to me for my birthday the other day and it's kind of a joke but uh, you saw it hanging on the door but uh, this would not phase Tommy. He would be undaunted and barge through anyway. Now you may have noticed that there's no mowing going on here in the neighborhood. Now, that's simply not because of Tommy uh, trying to be polite but it hasn't rained here in three or four weeks and it's incredibly dry. Do not try this at home. You know what? Those wire wheels were so aggressive that they took all the paint off. I had really no intention of taking it down to bare metal, but that's what I got, and that's good in a way. So whoever had painted it last had painted right over dirt and grease because that was filled in here in the corners. And that did scrape right out because it was there was no basis for the paint. But this will require primer, but it really is looking good. You can see that the casting was a relatively rough casting from the get-go. And now for the movable jaw, and I won't show much of that. It's just a matter of wire wheeling it. Some of you probably noticed that this is the Porter Cable Grinder that I bought at the same auction that I purchased uh, the vise at, so it's helping with the restoration. And I love this thing because it doesn't have one of those crazy safety switches and it has a, the switch right here. Just the handiest thing to use. I really like that. Well, now that these castings are cleaned up real well, you can see the extent of, of the wear or whatever it is that somebody did there. I just visualized they were putting a piece of millions of pieces in there and, and dropping them and each time it eroded a minute amount over a 50 year period but I don't know and then right here it looks like maybe they were in a tap through there and it hit the side of the vise and it's pretty well buggered up here none of this is going to hurt anything and someone had stamped their name here DH, but it's upside down. Something scratched here as well. And then on the other piece, uh, somebody had stamped the number six or nine or whatever, and you can see saw marks. There's quite a bit of wear to the jaw surfaces. Very little tooth left, but that doesn't bother me one bit. I do not like the real aggressive teeth. So I'm doing nothing with... Uh, the jaws. I'm not even taking them out. Okay, now I, I think I have done a real good job of removing all of the paint. Like I said, I didn't intend to and I have already degreased it off camera and I'm ready to go ahead and mask it and then spray it with primer and then with a finish coat. 
So I won't show you the masking. That's pretty boring stuff. This shows up real nice now, doesn't it? Okay, the castings are degreased and they are masked off, ready to go. And I'm going to apply a coat of Kmart Gray Primer.